uh, but this time it's not face to face, but um, uh, through a webinar. But uh, we are having more uh, attendance by this way, I guess. So thank you, John, for uh, your time and your uh, effort uh, being with us tonight, today. Thank you. Nilu Fair, thank you so much for that kind invitation. And, and thank you. And thank you, Mehmet, and, and the members of the board of TACAM for uh, this invitation to speak with you, your members, and, and your friends, our friends uh, around the world. Good morning to you all. Good afternoon. Good evening. I, I hope you are all staying safe and healthy and that your loved ones and family are safe and healthy. Um, it is good that we have this opportunity to be together. And, and certainly, again, I want to say thank you to the people, to the, to the members of TACAM and to the board of directors of TACAM for your long and continued interest in Hassan Kaif uh, and, and your interest in sharing information about Hassan Kaif. That is absolutely crucial. It continues to be crucial. And I'd also like to say, I've been in touch with friends in, in, in Hassan Kaif in, in recent days and mentioned that we would be uh, talking about their wonderful city today and the current situation. And so on behalf of our friends in Hassan Kaif, I would like to say hello to the members of TACAM and the board of directors. And again, thank you on behalf of, of the people of Hassan Kaif uh, your interest is a source of encouragement. It's a source of strength. And so indeed, we, we, do, say, we do say thank you. And, and I personally, of course, uh, owe a debt of gratitude to everyone in Hassan Kaif, uh, the people who have been so kind to me and helped make Hassan Kaif a home. Um, they've, they've taught me, they've guided me, and in the past 10 years, living off and on in Hassan Kaif, um, I, I feel I may be an old dog, but they've taught me many new things, and it's great to learn, and it's great to, to grow. So thank you, Hassan Kaif. Um, so with that, I'd, I'd like to start, and uh, let's see. Um, so. You know, our, our topic today is to think about uh, the majesty of Hassan Kaif and how we can share that majesty with future generations. So what we'll be focusing on today in, in the next 40 to 45 minutes is um, to think about the history of Hassan Kaif a little bit, what makes Hassan Kaif valuable as cultural heritage, but also to take, uh, to take a moment to, to consider some examples that give us a view of the current status of cultural heritage in Hassan Kaif. Uh, and then what remains to be saved uh, and what can be done to, to, to save what is still there and to ensure that this is, is relayed uh, effectively to, to uh, our children and grandchildren and their grandchildren. So it has been either only four years since we met in, in March of 2016, but it's been a long four years. So I'd like to, I'd like to take a moment to, to catch up. We met uh, together last time as TACAM in early March of 2016. A couple of weeks later, uh, Europa Nostra announced that Hassan Kaif had been included on Europa Nostra's seven most endangered program. And uh, that was a, a boost of energy to, uh, to the movement to save Hassan Kaif and to raise, to raise awareness and to, 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 to uh, lobby for uh, alternative approaches to energy generation and the operational specifications of the Illusu Dam in order to find a way to keep the dam, com complete the construction of the dam, and also uh, allow Hassan Kaif to uh, continue and to attract people to the region. Then, of course, just a few months later, in July of 2016, the terrible events of the, of the attempted coup and the two-year-long state of emergency that followed. Uh, of course, the state of emergency made it very difficult 
for, for people to share their views openly, to voice their protests, to voice their concern about developments taking place in Hassan Kaif and, and related to the ongoing construction of the Ila Sudan and hydroelectric power plant project. Uh, and, and during that period, from 2000, uh, during that period, preparation began in earnest to move the first of seven monuments that would be moved to higher ground from the ancient city of Hassan Kaif to the new settlement area. So in May, in May 2017, um, despite efforts by various organizations, including Hassan Kaif Matters and the Hassan Kaif Yashat Magri Shimi and, and FIVAS and Europa Nostra and other organizations to uh, delay or uh, alter the plans for the removal of the Zain al tomb, the tomb was removed finally in May of 2017 under armed guard no less, uh, if there ever was uh, a, a, a visual reminder that this was done without proper levels of public consultation, the, present of our, the presence of armed guard during the removal of the Zain al tomb uh, was one of those. Uh, over the next new two years, 2017 to 2019, another six monuments were removed to the new settlement area. In 2018, the dam was completed and uh, they began filling the reservoir in 2018. However, they uh, stopped filling the reservoir in 2018 due to concerns about drought in, in Iraq. Um, uh, this is a little bit of a footnote, again, uh, regarding the, the removal of the Zain al tomb. Um, in August of 2018, the Dutch national contact point for the OEC guidelines for international enterprises uh, it published its decision regarding the adverse impacts on human rights uh, in the context of the removal of the Zain el Bey tomb. Uh, and, and that focused on the company of Bresser, a Dutch company that which provided technology and expertise, which was crucial to being able to secure the foundation of the Zain al-Bey tomb and then to lift that and move it. And our complaint against Bresser, and this again was under the framework of the OECD guidelines, which are voluntary guidelines, but they're, they're, they're standards of international corporate ethics. Uh, our complaint was that this project to remove the Zain al-Bey tomb created in adverse impacts to the human rights of the affected people, including the local people of Hassan Kaif, because it did not include them as stakeholders in the process of planning and decision-making and monitoring the uh, advance of the project. So, it was good that the NCP in, in The Hague issued this decision in our favor, but again, these, uh, are, non, these are not legally binding decisions. So, uh, but still, it was important because it drew the line between cultural heritage and the human right to participate in the cultural life of the community. So that changes to uh, cultural heritage require ethically in the framework of international human rights, international law, and actually, as we'll see also in the context of, of Turkish national law, uh, require public consultation on matters that involve changes to uh, historical architectural monuments. Uh, End of footnote, <laughs> uh, the filling of the reservoir continued in 2019. Uh, most families in Hassan Kaif moved to the new settlement area on the, on the far side of the river in the fall of 2019. And then in 2020, with heavy rains throughout the fall and the winter, uh, things happened very uh, Water began to cover the, the highway bridge in February. Um, in, in March, April, and May, the advance of water uh, was, was, was startling, frankly, 
And uh, by, by April, as we'll see in some pictures, there were significant parts of the lower city of, of Hassan Kaif, which sadly were under water. So that, that, that's a quick summary of, of what has transpired related to Hassan Kaif over the past few years. And uh, it, it, it is a, a, a sad sequence of events. It's a saddening sequence of events. So again, what we'd like to do is think about uh, the history of Hassan Cave, its value as cultural heritage, and then take a moment to look at uh, the current status of cultural heritage in Hassan Cave, what remains to be seen, and uh, what remains to be saved and seen, for instance, uh, but also what can be done to ensure that future generations can also partake in this uh, magnificent historical event. So just um, uh, in terms of majesty, I mean, notwithstanding the, uh, you know, the electricity pole in the foreground here, uh, I, I think this, uh, this is a, a useful photograph to set in relief, in silhouette, uh, the, the main monuments, the main pillars of uh, what makes Hassan Cape so special, uh, particularly looking at the, at the medieval period, but also the classical Roman period and the late Roman period. Here in the very front of the frame, or in the center of the frame, uh, you recognize the tomb of Zainal Bey, distinguished by its um, slightly pointed onion-type dome, very typical of, of Timurid architecture and actually the only example of Timurid architecture in Anatolia. It was built as the burial place of Zainal Bey, the son of Akkoyunlu uh, leader, Uzun Hassan, who you'll remember uh, was the arch rival of Fahdi Mehmet, Mehmet II, Mehmet the conqueror of Istanbul. Um, they met in battle uh, in 1473 and Zainal, uh, Prince Zainal uh, died in that battle and, and this was his burial place. Uh, then, and that again is from the late 15th century, Art Koyunlu, Timurid style. Uh, and then behind, of course, is the, the Citadel Mount, the solid rock mount upon which the fortified city stands. Uh, it was originally developed as a, as a defense outpost by the Romans. And then in the fourth century, the Byzantine Emperor Constantinus II the, um, converted the defense outpost into a fortified city, building a palace and a chapel. Uh, and then by the, by the fifth century, you know, the, the city had grown and prospered to the extent that it became the see of a bishop. Uh, and Hassan Kaif was uh, in 451. Hassan Kaif was one of 400 cities of the Roman Empire participating in the Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon. So, so there we have a span of, of, of about 1,200, 1,300 years, just looking at the Zainal Bey tomb and the citadel of, of Hassan Cave. Of course, later in the medieval period, in the 12th century, uh, the, the Artukids, the uh, Turkmen vassals of the great Seljuks, uh, ruled Hassan Cave primarily in the 12th century and partly into the 13th, 13th century. And they used the foundations of the Byzantine palace uh, to, to reconstruct their own palace and also the foundations of the chapel on the citadel were used as the foundations of what became the Ulu Jami or the great mosque of the citadel. Then in the lower city uh, to the left of the, of the frame, you see a couple of minarets. And by the way, uh, just to refresh your memory, the, the Zainal Bey tomb, of course, uh, sits on the left bank or the, the, to the north of the Tigris River, which at this point is running pretty much from west to east on its course to the, the Arab Gulf. Uh, so on this side of the river, on the north side of the river, we have the Zainal Bey tomb. And the cliff of the citadel sits uh, right next to the river. And the lower city as well is on the right bank to the south of the, of the Tigris River. Uh, the first minaret that you see is closer to the river, the one on the left. It's the minaret of the Rizk Mosque. And the second is the, the minaret of the Suleiman Mosque. Uh, both of these were built in the late 14th century, early 15th century. 
during the rule of the Ayyubids. And, and it's this period of Artukid, Ayyubid, and Atkuyunlu rule from the 12th century to the 15th century uh, that leaves us with the most visibly striking monuments of, of Turkish Islamic architecture in, in Hassan Cave. It's really an extraordinary uh, collection of diverse styles of architecture. Uh, and also very interesting, um, very interesting uh, engineering uh, achievements as well. The famous bridge of Hassan Cave uh, stood in front of the citadel, but we're looking at it now from a different angle. Uh, we've moved down river a little bit and we've changed seasons, of course. Uh, the, our, the bridge was built in the 12th century. Um, it had a very long uh, span across the river and uh, considerable height. Uh, it was built in the 12th century during the Artukid period and uh, the 13th century Arab geographer and traveler Yakut noted that it was one of the largest structures that he had ever seen. Um, so in, in terms of creative human genius, in terms of uh, architectural and technological advancements, Hassan Kaif clearly uh, has some very uh, important, universally valuable examples of, 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 of human achievement. Just to back up a little bit, um, of course, uh, Hassan Kaif is also much older than the medieval period. Uh, as it turns out, what we know about primarily in Hassan Kaif dates to the medieval period somewhat to the late Roman period. And then we jump back a long way in history, 12,000 years back in history, to one of the first organized uh, human settlements discovered anywhere. The, the Neolithic mound at Hassan Cave with uh, evidence of, of organized settlement dates to 9,500 BCE, uh, that you know, affirming a very long history. There are still a lot of questions about what happened in the intervening a thousand years between the between this first settlement. Um, they were hunter-gatherers, by the way. They were not agriculturalists. They were hunter-gatherers. So, but, you know, there, there's still big questions about what happened between that lifestyle of hunter-gatherers and the use of Hassan Cave as a defense outpost for, for the Romans. It looks now that we may, it looks now as though we may never learn um, because that, that, that heritage could be lost in the layers of, of dirt and mud submerged beneath the, the Ilisu Bridge. But let's hope not. Uh, let's hope that uh, changes can be made and a, and a change of policy can be made so that archaeological excavations can continue. Um, but uh, two other things to emphasize, of course, uh, before moving on. It, you know, the, it, there is hardly any site in the world uh, that shows such a long period of the interchange of human values and, and human ideas. So, so Hassan Kaif, from, from the first settlements to the period of the uh, Mitanni state and Assyria and Urartu and the Persians and the Romans and so on, uh, there is so much in Hassan Kaif still to be learned. Uh, so those are, these, these are a couple of items that I think are crucial to our recognition of Hassan Kaif as, as, as important cultural heritage for everyone. It's old, really old, and you get a sense of that uh, uh, depth of history and extent of history when you're there. But it's also an integral whole. I mean, in, in, those aren't my words. Those are the words of uh, Olush Aruk. Uh, the head of archaeological excavations in Hassan Cave from 2000, well, in the 90s and, and early 2000s. Um, he emphasized that what we have in Hassan Cave is an integral whole of, of streets and urban technology, water distribution systems, uh, water purification systems, uh, a, a history of human habitat from caves to built structures and so on and so forth, even manufacturing facilities, the ceramic kilns. Uh, all in interaction as human technology in a natural landscape. And of course, this is the Upper Tigris Basin 
and it's really the cradle of civilization, but it's also uh, a globally significant area for the preservation of biological diversity. You know, out of, you know, I think 430 bird species identified in Turkey, 130 of those species have been identified, observed in Hassan Cave, and 25 of those species are, are, are threatened. They're endemic species that are threatened or endangered. So this, the, the, the natural ecosystem is also something to cherish and also to, to protect. But I think, yeah, you know, cultural heritage can seem a little academic and there's nothing academic about Hassan Cave. Uh, because, well, I mean, there's plenty that's academic about Hassan Cave, but it's also, uh, I think people very often express a feeling of being at home as soon as they arrive in, in the city. They feel calmness, they feel tranquility. Uh, some people will, will tell our friends who, who have uh, guest houses, I feel like I've always been here. And uh, I, I think that feeling of home, of course, is important to the people of Hassan Cape, but it's also important to, to those of us who travel a long way, maybe 30 kilometers from Batman or 150 kilometers from Batman or a few miles from Arkansas to get to, to Hassan Cape. It's something, no matter how far we travel to Hassan Cape, we can feel this sense of belonging. And I think, it, I mean, surely that's, uh, that comes partly from the fact that human beings for 12,000 years have found this a, a good place to be and to live. But I think that feeling is, is grounded to a certain extent in the river. Of course, this is one of the oldest trade corridors of the world, the Tigris River. So Hassan Cape is open to the world, but it's also protected. It's not uh, vulnerably open. It's open and sheltered by the rock of the citadel, as we saw before, and, uh, and here uh, behind the lower city, on the southern side of the city, city you see the cliff of the Rat Tibba Hill. Uh, and, and this is a magnificent site. It's, it's wonderful to be in the lower city of Hassan Cape and know that that, that that rock is there, because it's a sense of protection. You're in a garden, but you're, you're, it's a walled garden, you're, you're protected. So um, a lot to, to see there in, in that magnificent city. Um, I, I just wanted to, to point out here that there's a river palace next to, uh, that, that probably dates next to the river, uh, dates to probably the uh, Umayyad period, according to uh, Olush Aruk. Uh, but again, that has uh, that that needs to be validated, I, I suspect. But uh, Professor Aruk notes that the structure of this palace is quite unusual. It doesn't fit a pattern that's observed in, in elsewhere in Anatolia. It's not part of the Turkish Islamic history of architecture. He sees resemblances with the Umayyad palaces of Palestine and Syria. Uh, of the seventh century and the eighth century. So it's interesting to look at this palace on the edge of the river to think what life might have been like in Hassan Cape in the seventh or eighth century, just after the advent of Islam, when the city continued to be majority Christian population, but now the rulers were Muslims. So that early period is another uh, area crying out for additional research. Now, we've come around the city uh, we've come around to the south side of the city. We're now on top of that hill, Ratz Tibba. And we're looking down on the central uh, area of the lower city of Hassan Cape. Uh, and I'll just use, I hope you can see the cursor. Um, here in the right, um, just poking out from the, the names, uh, if you see the names of participants here, this is the Kuzlar Jami, or the Maiden's Mosque, uh, probably dating to the uh, Umayyad, uh, Ayyubid period. Next, right, just a few meters from it is also the Koch Mosque, the Mosque of the Ram, which is built quite distinctively in great Seljuk style with a, an Avon, a, gra a grand arched uh, passageway, uh, nearly unique in Anatolia in being a mosque with a, a, an arched entryway. 
Uh, and then you have the funerary mosque of Sultan, Sultan, uh, Sultan Suleiman, built in the late 14th century. And then down here next to the bridge, where the bridge enters the lower city, you see again the minaret of the Rizq Mosque, also built during the reign of Sultan Suleiman in the early 15th century. And then the bridge uh, from the Artukid period. Uh, the, this is the Kuchuk Sarai here at the northeast corner of the citadel, possibly built by the Akkoyunluz, uh, the small palace, as they say. And then in the distance, the, the Zainal Bay tomb with its distinctive uh, onion, onion dome. So there's, there's quite uh, an arrangement, I think, uh, interacting between the, the design of the city and the topography. And um, it's, it's just beautiful to behold. I, 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 I think many would agree, if not everyone would agree, it's simply majestic. Um, we were we were extremely grateful to Europa Nostra for including Hassan Kaif on uh, Europe's uh, seven most endangered program for 2016. Uh, and it was particularly energizing uh, to see Europa Nostra recognize Hassan Kaif as, quote, one of the most important architectural and archaeological sites in Europe. Here we are, uh, a site in southeast Turkey, in upper Mesopotamia, uh, uh, but of course, Turkey is a member of the Council of Europe and Europa Nostra members come from a, uh, the full range of countries in the Council of Europe. So this is universal heritage. It is European heritage. And, and we all uh, have an interest in, 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 in the fate of, of Hassan Kaif. In addition to some of the things we've already noted, Hassan Kaif in, in the years preceding uh, it, it's, it's flooding um, during a period of, you know, strong economic growth in the 2012 to 2015, you know, it had hundreds of thousands of visitors every year, uh, which it reinforced our conviction that Hassan Cape could be an important anchor for tourism in, in the region. Uh, and that was, uh, that was, our motivation in working with the uh, Cultural Awareness Foundation, Kultur Bilingini Gajtir Mevakva, and uh, the initiative to keep Hassan Kaif alive, we as Hassan Kaif Matters wanted to spur a dialogue about what's the best way to steward national resources for sustainable development, both to preserve cultural heritage, but also to optimize opportunities for economic and, and cultural prosperity. Um, of course, uh, that dialogue did not get very far because, again, in 2016, the, the political situation changed drastically. Uh, it's been a long effort to raise awareness about, um, about Hassan Kaif, and uh, I came to this effort late. Hassan Kaif Matters was, of course, not formed until 2012. Uh, in previous years, uh, so many people had done uh, amazing work to... Uh, raise awareness about Hassan Cape and raise awareness about the importance of stakeholder uh, consultation, particularly uh, architectural historian Dr. Zeynep Ahumbay and Dr. Uzge Balkuz prepared a, uh, working with Doa Derne, prepared uh, a, a summary of the magnificence of Hassan Cape in terms of the 10 criteria, any one of which might be used to qualify a site to be uh, considered universally valuable cultural heritage under UNESCO, under the UNESCO framework. And uh, it, it, it's widely believed uh, and argued that Hassan Kaif meets nine of the 10 criteria that uh, the World Heritage Committee considers in admitting a site as world heritage um, status. Uh, the only item that's, that Hassan Kaif uh, does not uh, meet is it's, it's not the site of the origin of a religion or the creation of a, a literary or artistic work that has become uh, almost foundational uh, for, for many peoples throughout, throughout the world. 
but in terms of human genius, technological architectural achievement, earth history, that millions, hundreds of millions of geological history that you can observe just walking around the mountains of Hassan Cave, uh, diversity, or habitat. It's there in Hassan Cave. And it's, we need to remember that this struggle is not over. There's still valuable heritage that requires and deserves attention and, and proper conservation. Uh, one, one point to underscore as well, uh, I believe, uh, is, is that Hassan Kaif is, is a compelling site because it's, it's old, it's this architectural achievement, the interaction with nature, and it feels like home. And part of why it feels like home is it's a living community. We can go to Hassan Kaif, we can form friendships, we can live in Hassan Kaif. Uh, and and I'm, I, I am so fortunate and grateful to have been able to do that. I'm grateful for these friendships. And, uh, you know, it, clearly the people, their intangible cultural heritage, their traditional practices, their stories, these tell us not only uh, something about the community that is there today, but certainly uh, their relationship with the environment. The, the way they grow gardens, the way they take advantage of the supply of water that flows down from the upland uh, hills, both above water and below water, the plants for which they forage, the seeds they eat. Um, these, are, these practices today are clues into how people likely lived in this environment for thousands, tens of thousands of years. And, and this intangible cultural heritage, uh, again, it, it, it requires attention. There's a, there's a film that I believe uh, 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 Professor Mehmet Ayaya has, has shared with you. It's, it's, it's available here. It's, it's an excellent look at Hassan Cave, at legend, at childhood, and the future uh, from the eyes of a young friend from Hassan Kaif. Um, so as I mentioned before, Hassan Kaif is kind of a walled garden. It's a sort of paradise, literally a kind of paradise watered by underground streams. Um, and, and our friend Thurat Argun, the owner of Hassan Kaif Hasbache, the, the guest house where I was able to live for almost 10 years, told a journalist of the New York Times, I have found already my heaven. Uh, there's, why move? Why leave? Why give this up? And, uh, but, but Firat and the other residents of, of Hassan Cave have given up uh, their homes in, in uh, ancient Hassan Cave. And uh, I'm, I apologize for the rather abrupt shift to today's view of Hassan Cave. Uh, but this is the new settlement area, which makes a lot of sense if you're looking at it from a satellite. If you're in the town, uh, it takes 45 minutes to walk from one side of the new settlement area to the other. That compares to Hassan Cave, the ancient Hassan Cave, where you could walk from the residential neighborhood to the commercial center of town and, and do your job in 10 to 15 minutes. You were always close to your family, you were always close to your friends, you were always close to work, you were always close to the river uh, and to the cultural heritage. Now everything is taken and it's, it's expanded, it's, it's spread out, it's sprawl, uh, which incidentally will in undoubtedly already has, has increased people's dependence on motorized transportation. Um, so it is, a, it is a difficult transition to move from ancient Hassan Cave to the new city, to the, to the new settlement area. Here you see the Zain el Bey tomb, and I apologize for the uh, less than ideal quality of the photograph, but here is the Zain el Bey tomb in its new location. Uh, and by, behind it, it, it is really, uh, I think, uh, dwarfed in a way uh, by this, um, larger structure, which is part of the tourism faculty that they've built in Hassan Cave. It's uh, an odd structure. It's a, it's a cylindrical tower topped by a conical dome. 
Um, and really, frankly, it's, it's out of place in Upper Mesopotamia. It, it belongs in Ahlat or close to Van. It's, you know, a very traditional Seljuk uh, style funerary uh, uh, structure, uh, typical of the Anatolian highlands. But it's, it's out of place here and, and the concrete environment of the, the, of the Zainobi tomb just seems um, unfortunate. So the new, the new situation in the town is difficult. Uh, the climatic and soil conditions are different, difficult. So the people who have always depended on, on gardening, on orchards, on foraging, for their figs, their pomegranates, their, ra their grapes, their tomatoes, their ajour, their cucumbers, and so on, this is, this is gone. And, and they'll have to work the soil quite diligently for years before, before it begins producing. The layout of the town, as I, as I alluded to before, weakens social co cohesion. It makes it difficult for people who were neighbors to maintain their, their friendships without getting in a car and driving across town. Um, and the, the shepherds, most of the shepherds who are still tending flocks, get in a boat and cross the lake now to retend to, to uh, tend to the uh, herds that still pasture in the hills to the south of, of Hassan Cave. Um, the, the, the point that I'd like to emphasize here is, is in the next few minutes, is that the salvaged monuments, the monuments that have been uh, lifted up and moved or dismantled and moved and reassembled in the new settlement area, uh, they stand apart from the new settlement area. Uh, they are no longer an integral part of the living community of, of Hassan Cave. And that's nothing less than tragic. It's, it's, it's a, um, it diminishes the dignity, it diminishes the sense of identity of, of the local people. And frankly, for all of us uh, who could have uh, participated in this uh, cultural heritage in the ancient city. So uh, this is obviously not a current photograph. It was taken earlier this year. Uh, it shows up here in the top right, this is the new Hassan Cape Museum. Uh, in the front, you have the middle portal of the citadel, uh, which stands on a slope from what will be the lake that, that comes here. Uh, and then uh, tourists, would, would disembark from their boat, climb the stairs as if they're climbing up to the citadel, the upper city of Hassan Cave, and then they find themselves again in the lower city with the Rizk Mosque. Uh, the minaret for the Rizk Mosque had not yet been reassembled in this photograph from January, and then the, the minaret you see behind you here is the Suleiman Mosque, and then in the distance, as we'll see in a minute, is the Kuzlar Jami, or the Maiden's Mosque. Um, of course, there's a, a photograph of the lake. Um, this tweet from An Anadolu Ajansu, Hassan Cape is awaiting new visitors, or Hassan Cape is eagerly awaiting its visitors with its new face. Uh, this tweet from the Turkey semi-official news agency provoked quite a bit of of reaction, negative reaction from, from the public. But there you get a sense of what it's like with the lake. So just very quickly, there's seven monuments that were transported from ancient Hassan Cave to the new settlement area. Uh, and there is quite a bit. The, I mean, the entire lower city of Hassan Cave contains 10,000 years worth of, of archaeology, 12,000 years worth of archaeology going down layer by layer by layer into the soil. Uh, but just what we know about from the medieval period, you have the Salahia Gardens, some of the best preserved gardens from the Seljuk era. You have evidence of, 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 of Christian life in Hassan Cave, which continued for centuries. Christians were a major element of the Hassan Cave population really quite late, maybe even into the 20th century. Uh, the Coach Mosque, which I mentioned with its grand arched Avon, uh, is also left under underwater, encased in mud and encased in 
dirt and then covered by concrete, uh, but it's, it's there, and the Artuka Bridge uh, as well, also encased, restored, strengthened, reinforced, and then covered uh, to be protected under the water. And the Neolithic Mound is also now under the water. Just really quickly uh, to look at some of the monuments that we find in the archaeological of the new settlement area uh, are the, um, again, the Maidens Mosque, the Suleiman Mosque, and the Risk Mosque. And here in the top left, you see them arranged in the ancient city. And you see here in the bottom of the frame that in the new archaeological park, they are arranged in a, in a parallel fashion. So here, the, the, the Maidens Mosque, and then the, uh, the minaret and the funerary complex of, of Suleiman, uh, Ayyubid Sultan Suleiman. And then beyond that, you have the Rizk Mosque and then the middle portal. On the, you know, to the right here, you have a new bridge that's built to connect the new market area of, of Hassan Cave with the archaeological park and the museum. And then in the distance, on the other side of what here is now an inlet uh, next to the lake, is the Zainal Bay tomb. So I, I just want to take a moment to compare and contrast the situation of, of the Maidens Mosque, uh, an Ayyubid Mosque, uh, with its current situation in the archaeological park. Uh, so it's, it's, it's cultural heritage, it's historical, it's unique, it, it's a funerary, it's actually a funerary monument. It was not built originally as a mosque, probably in the Ayyubid period. Uh, but it became a mosque in recent decades. But historically, it's been uh, a funerary complex and quite an interesting one because it doesn't fit, again, it doesn't fit any pattern that's seen in uh, Turkish Islamic architecture and other parts of, of Anatolia. Uh, it's a rectangle. And there are four chambers, one at each corner of the rectangle. Each, uh, each chamber is domed. And these, these would have been uh, the, the, where, where, where tombs were, were held, or the sarcophagi were, were held. In recent decades, this historical monument uh, became a functioning mosque. They added uh, in the, along the back wall, along the south wall, between the uh, funerary chambers at either corner of the structure, they added a prayer hall. Uh, and uh, this, is a, this is a photograph from, from Ramadan during an afternoon Quran recitation during Ramadan in, in 2012. It, so the, the building became part of the, it became part of the community. It became one of the main mosques of, of, of the community, just right on the edge of the residential neighborhood. You know, we may, you know, the, 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 the interior architectural design, the tiles and the carpet, the, uh, the minbar and the mihrab may not be to our taste. We may prefer something a little more traditional, a little more historically appropriate, if you will, but the point is that this historic mon monument was part of the community. And the, 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 in my opinion, the participation of, of, of members of the community in the life of this monument, they are part of the history of, of this structure. They become part of the cultural heritage and they become something to preserve. Uh, somehow a, for future generations. And yet, the decision of the authorities was to completely demolish the modern prayer hall um, and then uh, cut the building into parts and set the walls of the building into concrete foundations and move it in pieces from its original location to a new location. Uh, and Here's, uh, here's a picture. This is, uh, again, this is technology from the, Bre uh, the Dutch firm Bresser. Bresser is primarily a foundations uh, reinforcement company, but they also are involved in, in structure removal. So what they do is first they create a concrete foundation beneath the historic walls. So when they move a structure, they're moving the concrete foundation, which is holding the historical uh, uh, artifact. And here is an example of, of the move 
the building has been uh, cut apart and it's moved. The concrete blocks holding the pieces of the building are, are then moved. And this is what we end up with uh, is, uh, I, I think, really a most unfortunate placement of what had been one of two major functioning mosques in Hassan Cape. Now it's at the back of the archaeological park um, in a hole. Uh, on on landfill and 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 that's they've they've created a stage they've they've created a stage for tourists to come and observe the buildings that they've saved quote unquote you see the observation stands up here in the back and you can imagine that there will be loud sound and light shows that uh, display Hassan Cave's magnificent Artukid and Ayyubid uh, heritage to tourists who come to Hassan Cave. But this building had been part of the living community of Hassan Cave. And an alternative approach would have been to find a way to reintegrate this cultural heritage into the community uh, at, at closer to where they live and closer to where they pray. And, and this is not a new idea. This is an idea that's, that's part of the, uh, a part of UNESCO's uh, convention uh, starting the World Heritage Project. Um, you know, cultural heritage needs to have a place in the life of the community. And, and here it's, it's divorced from the life of the community. I realize that we're running short on time, so I just want to observe very quickly that this structure here on the right is the uh, Imam Abdullah tomb. Uh, it is, it was in its original location. Uh, it was on the bank, it was on a hill on the bank, on the left bank of the river, next to the highway at the end of the bridge. So that on special occasions, like the first day of Bayram after Ramadan, uh, members of the town would come and, 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 and pay their respects to this tomb. Uh, this tomb was considered to be a protector of Hassan Cave. It's spiritually the most important monument in Hassan Cave, or it was until it was picked up and it was moved. It was, it was really quite um, uh, traumatic to see that, that hill devoid of this tomb. And then they they combine it with other tombs that have been moved from other places in a complex that has a decidedly degraded or degrading position. Again, on the side of a slope, on infill, it's below this new market area that's been built. Uh, it's, it's below the, the residential area with its concrete structures. It's just not an appropriate location for uh, spiritually the most significant monument of, of Hassan Cave. Um, so, so generally, this, this, this type of approach to Hassan Cave has, it's, it's broken the, the infrastructure and enables social co cohesion, and it has very significant impacts on the majesty of this cultural heritage. It has impacts on the, the dignity, the sense of dignity that people feel when they observe these buildings. And it's a violation of human rights because it, it was done without proper consultation of the affected peoples. Now, again, moving quickly, we've got the uh, Kuchuk Sarai here at the top right, as seen from the historic market in the old city. Uh, this is the, the bottom right-hand photograph here is the most recent photograph that we have of the small palace of the citadel. So they, they built this massive rock and concrete wall around the citadel in order to protect the limestone mount upon which the citadel sits from erosion by the, by the water coming into contact with the rock. So they built a massive rock and concrete wall. And yet it's not working, unfortunately. They, you know, in, in the spring here on the right, you see that water seeped through the, the barrier and, and began filling the small palace, which is at the northeast corner of the citadel. And here, and, and, and please friends, remember that they started filling the reservoir 
uh, the water arrived in Hassan Cave in, in late December, early January of 2020. And it wasn't until April or May that, that the lower city of Hassan Cave was significantly flooded below meters of water. And yet already by July, um, you see there's a failure of, of this reinforcement, which was meant to protect not only the, the small palace, but the entire citadel now. So something has gone terribly wrong. Um, according, to, uh, according to local newspapers, there is discussion of the possibility of raising the lesser palace by five meters so that it will not be threatened by uh, the possibility of seeping water. That, of course, does nothing for the rest of the uh, citadel uh, and the mount upon which it stands. Uh, the, the point that I would like to stress here is that this is a problem that arises uh, from lack of proper consultation of the public. And by the public, we mean, according to Turkish law, um, well, as a party to the Council of Europe Count, uh, Convention on the Preservation of the Architectural Heritage of Europe, uh, Turkey, having ratified this convention and transcribed it into Turkish law, has an obligation to establish in the various stages of the decision-making process appropriate machine machinery for the supply of information, consultation, and cooperation between the state, the regional and local authorities, cultural institutions and associations, and the public. Uh, again and again, whether it's Canal Istanbul or whether it's the walls of, 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 of of, of Sur, the, the, whether it's the walls of Diyarbakir or here in um, Hassan Cave, there is, you know, the policy is set in Ankara and the technicians are the technicians chosen by Ankara. It's a failure to, to consult with the public, to consult with professional organizations, civil society organizations, uh, and, uh, and professional experts. Who, who have an experience, who have broad experience. So, but, I mean, basically it's, I mean, and this is very, and, and this is a very, a, a very common uh, principle now in, in, in corporate management, right? You know, diversity, diversity in your culture, diversity in your corporate management is going to strengthen your performance. That's, that's documented. And here we have, we have what looks like a lack of stakeholder consultation leading to problems. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to just take a, a five more minutes to, to wrap up with very quickly a, a look at the Hassan Cave Museum uh, and highlight that there is much here that is worth seeing. Uh, it's, it's startling what, what is on view. For example, this chlorite bowl uncovered from Kortik Tepe in Diyarbakir province dating to the Neolithic period. Also particularly, uh, partic particularly fascinating are these examples of early Islamic writing, stone inscriptions found in Hassan Cave. Uh, stone inscriptions showing early examples of Arabic epigraphy are extremely rare. They're rare, they're, they're to be valued. And also it's intriguing to see these here because it makes us think that maybe there's more. I mean, if you go back to the Mardinike Palace, that river palace that shows resemblance to Umayyad palaces, and if you look at these stone inscriptions, you think there may be more about the early Islamic period that we could learn in Hassan Cave if we just keep doing more excavations. From the, from the Coach Mosque, uh, done in great Seljuk style. You see on display at the entrance of the museum this excellent example of stucco carving in, in great Seljuk style. Unfortunately, the heavy rains um, uh, took a toll on the roof uh, built by Toki and its contractors. And by March, uh, the second floor of the museum was in a state that they had to close it due to leaks through the roof. 
And unfortunately, they later had to close the entire museum and it remains closed indefinitely. Um, again, uh, uh, poor planning, poor execution. Um, there should be, you know, it's unfortunate. This is where the lower of city, this is where the lower city of Hassan Keith was. Uh, the gardens, uh, the Coach Mosque, and um, the Suleiman Mosque. It's now a lake and it's a difficult view to behold. Uh, of course, it's also beautiful in a way. It's, 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 it's a natural environment with uh, significant human intervention but it's still beautiful. Um, at, the, at a gorge that enters the lower city, uh, you have a cave, a cave church, as you can tell from the cross here on the wall. It's this cave down at the bottom. It was submerged by April, as you see in the lower left. And then by, by August, it was several meters beneath water. Again, uh, late Ottoman census records indicate that in the late 16th century, as much as 60% of the households of Hassan Kaif were Christian, and yet Christian cultural heritage is omitted from the Turkish government's program to protect cultural heritage and to, to educate people about the past. That, that should change. Uh, this heritage should be protected, it should be documented, and it should be included in the presentation in the Hassan Kaif Museum. Uh, also, you see, I mean, you, things happen fast. Uh, this is from the Salahia Gardens, the Seljuk era gardens from the lower city. Uh, just very quickly, these walls were as they were in 2012. They had survived hundreds of years this way. Uh, after immersion under the water, as you see in the right hand at the top, and then in the summer months, the water recedes, <clears throat> and this is the uh, sorry condition of those same rock walls just a few months later. So it's really terrifying to imagine the extent of uh, damage that could occur to archaeological and architectural remains left exposed to the water not just over months, but possibly over, over decades. Um, what remains to be saved? Um, it's a living community. And the way to save the living community and its relationship with the surrounding environment is to stay connected with this community, to maintain our friendships, uh, to keep visiting. And when you do visit, which hopefully you will be able to visit before too long, um, you know, please arrange to spend more than a day. The museum is worth visiting. The archaeological park is worth visiting. Uh, but even more worthwhile will be the day-long walks that you take in the Raman Mountains on the left bank or in the, the foothills of the Tour Abdim Plateau on, on the right bank. Uh, and there are people who know the territory, so they'll be glad to show you around. Cave mosques, as well as cave churches, built structures from the, from the Christian tradition. You see here in the north, the Raman Mountains, there are trails there. They are steep, they're a little intimidating, but it's, it's beautiful. And here as well, uh, these rugged hills are, are worth exploring. They're villages in the hinterlands. Uh, much has been lost, but there's tremendous beauty that can be preserved, and it must be preserved actively, uh, prefer preferably in the context of, of, of a broad comprehensive plan for sustainable development with a component emphasizing nature and culture tourism. Because if there's not a plan, it'll it'll develop in a, in a random kind of way and will lose the landscape to, to concrete. So I want to say thank you, uh, first of all, but I also want to say, please stay informed and please stay aware of, of what we can do to, to ensure that as much as possible, as much uh, as possible of Hassan's case, majesty, majesty, its dignity, 
its humanity can be passed on to, to future generations. So thank you for keeping in touch. Thank you for continuing to keep in touch. And, and please share uh, and do come to Hassan Keith and visit. We also have recommendations or demands, if you will, of the Turkish government. Uh, the conditions in the new settlement area are extremely difficult, both from I mean, physical conditions for the local people, but also employment conditions. So those problems must be addressed uh, promptly. And there should be, you know, there should be uh, training programs, capacity development programs, and ideally these capacity development, skills development, uh, educational training programs should be but research and uh, sociological, ethnographical uh, research to document the cultural, the intangible cultural heritage of Hassan Cape and, and the surrounding villages in the, in the region. So that that becomes then ultimately the, the basis for uh, a comprehensive framework for uh, sustainable development. Ultimately, we would like to see Hassan Cape above water, the lower city, above water so that archaeological research can continue. We'd like to see the river run freely and the natural ecosystem return to its natural balance. And um, this is probably a, a discussion. This is a big ask. It's a long reach, but uh, something needs to change in UNESCO. Um, UNESCO did not provide a framework through which the plight of Hassan Cape could be adequately uh, debated. Uh, and, and, and discussed. And, and also don't forget the uh, major suppliers in the supply chain of the, Hassan, uh, of the Ilha Sudan and hydro, hydroelectric power plant project. Uh, they have leverage over the project and particularly uh, they should do what they can to use that leverage and ensure that the uh, Christian element of Hassan Cape's cultural heritage is not lost for future generations. Again, uh, I, I, first of all, I apologize for, for taking much longer than, than, than I had set out to, but I thank you for your participation. I thank you for your interest. Um, and, and especially uh, thank you, Professor Mehmet Yaya, uh, president of Takam, and, and thank you, Dr. Nilgun uh, Asan Birgin, thank you for, for the opportunity to speak with Takam. And, and of course, thank you to the various photographers in Hassan Cave and, uh, and elsewhere who've, who've contributed to our effort and to the various uh, civil society organizations that help the world stay informed about what's happening in, in Hassan Cave. So um, with that, I, I hope we still have some time for questions but um, again thank you and uh, hope to see you in Hassan Cave before too long. Thank you very much John. Um, it was a great and uh, great talk. You gave lots of information about the past and the current situation uh, in Hassan Cave and well uh, personally I was I mean although I saw the videos of current um, changes. Uh, I was still sad uh, seeing that the city, I guess, lost its soul. Um, although some buildings are preserved, but I can uh, I can say that the, the soul of the or spirit of the area is little uh, is mostly lost. Yeah. Um, well, um, uh, thank you again and. Um, if there are questions, you can write or uh, uh, unmute yourself or any comments, questions. Thank you very much, Jan. And if, I, if you don't mind, I have a quick question for Jan as well. Before this sure. presentation, we had a, a little discussion with Jan uh, and we were discussing this UNESCO World Heritage Site, site designation for Hassan Cave. And uh, after our discussion, I checked uh, the UNESCO webpage for these uh, national uh, the heritage sites. Uh, and I realized it's, it's uh, maddening or make me upset not seeing Hassan Cave being part of this 
World Heritage Sites. Maybe uh, John can uh, chime on it a little bit, why this is not the case for Hassan Cave. He explained it to me, but uh, I, I thought it might, it might be a good idea to share with the rest of the, the participants to know why it's not part of this World Heritage Site. Thank you, Mehmet. Uh, yes, it is, it is maddening and, and frustrating. And uh, many people, not just in Turkey, but internationally, there's so many people who really are outraged that UNESCO was not able to do something to at least try to save Hassan Cave from flooding. And the reason is simply that UNESCO and the World Heritage Program are offices of the United Nations. The United Nations is a, an, an, international governmental, an international governmental organization, uh, the members of which are states, states parties to the United Nations. So under the UNESCO framework, it's the responsibility of the state party, the government of the country in which the cultural heritage is located, is responsible for nominating that site for consideration as world heritage. Obviously, the Turkish government had other plans for the Upper Tigris Basin, and it elected not to nominate Hassan Cave for world heritage status. Um, we believe that should change. And that means that means getting the active states that gets that means getting the uh, international diplomats who are the representatives of the states parties serving on the World Heritage Convention uh, to consider new ways to broaden the discourse, to broaden the dialogue, to broaden the process of nominating and reviewing sites for world heritage status. Uh, but that's a big, <laughs> that's a big steep hill and it's not going to help Hassan Cape, but um, you know, we're not, we're not thinking just about the short term. Uh, John, um, I don't know you would be agree with me, but um, uh, I don't think it would change if it was a UNESCO area. It wouldn't change anything in terms of Turkish government policy. Because starting early 90s, there were lots of activists in Turkey started petition to stop the dam project. Uh, I was one of them to sign for that petition. And uh, unfortunately, it I mean, it didn't work and, um, you know, we came to today. Um, so, we, we, I mean, Hagia Sophia is also part of UNESCO Heritage Site. It didn't change the, the, the decision of government. So, I doubt that, uh, you know, being part of uh, UNESCO Heritage Site would stop the Turkish government's Elijah Dam project. Right. Yeah. The, you, thank you for that question. It's a wonderful question. It's a wonderful. It's a wonderful observation. Actually, it's not a question, um, but I. But I would, if if I may, I'd like to to respond a little bit to uh, to your comment. Um, of course, Hagia Sophia uh, has not been destroyed uh, in some people's eyes. Uh, its significance as cultural heritage, as universal cultural heritage, may have been altered or possibly diminished in some people's eyes by the conversion from a museum to a mosque. But the structure is there, uh, and and it, you know, it it should be there, and it and it will be there. Um, and and of course, the the. Southeastern Anatolian project goes back a long way. You know, it was the, the idea to build dams in, 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 in Southeast Turkey goes back to the days of Ataturk. And the first technical, the first very general technical specifications for the Ilisu Dam uh, were drawn up in the 1950s. And then in the 70s, I think it was more, uh, uh, more precise technical design were prepared. 
So this was a lot, so this dam, the Ilisu Dam and the eventual flooding of Hasenke were a long way, a long time in the making. There was a lot of preparation uh, that, that led up to the loss of Hasenke. Uh, so on the one hand, on the one, on the one hand, it was always going to happen. That's what many people felt. On the other hand, you, you never know what the future is. And you, you, you have to decide what you think is a reasonable uh, goal. Uh, even if it's a distant goal, it may be a reasonable goal. And our goal was to prompt a dialogue. Uh, our goal as, you know, um, advocates for Hassan Cave working in, in participation with other organizations in, in Europa Nostra and the initiative to keep Hassan Cave alive. Um, and I do believe that prior to the attempted coup of 2016 and the long period, the state of emergency, I do believe that there, was, there were signs that dialogue was possible. Um, you know, Abdul Gul in 2013, when uh, he was effectively uh, in control because uh, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan was traveling in North Africa, and during the, the first Gezi protests, Abdullah Gul said, isn't this wonderful? People are exercising their democratic right to protest. Um, so I, I, I do believe that there were uh, people in the government who would have been sympathetic to at least hearing and considering alternative ideas for saving Hassan Kaif and alterating, altering the operational specifications for the Ilisu Dam. Maybe not generating electricity, but using it for a kind of, of flood control. Again, it was, it was a distant reach. It was a long goal. But there was, I believe, a possibility of dialogue. Uh, and that possibility of dialogue was abruptly ended. Uh, and, and, I mean, completely ended because within the inner circle of, of advisors, it became clear that uh, absolutely no difference of opinion was, was allowed. And it's that idea that there might be difference of opinion even among close advisors that we were really hoping to uh, somehow leverage to expand. But um, I think you're right. <laughs> I mean, even if it had been declared, as, that would be that would be a different universe. It would be a parallel universe. Thank you. Well, I guess from now on we should still <laughs> work on to protect more, like or protect or prevent more harm to the area, right? Absolutely, absolutely. All over, all over the world, all over the world and all over Turkey. So it's, our job is never done. <laughs> uh, any questions, any more comments? I, I don't see in the chat area, but... Um, let me check in there. There's any in the... I don't see the chat area. No, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the, the, the chat area. I don't see any questions, but it's so wonderful to see messages from dear friends. Um, you know, some, some from the Takam community far and wide and others from the Hassan Cape community, the Istanbul community. Thank you. Thank you all very much for, for your participation and your, your continued interest. It's, uh, I think uh, Sumar Peck uh, is among the audience too, who was the first introduce you to us uh, back yes. in 2016. Yes. And uh, really? thank you for his uh, uh, intervention for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> he's he's <you>. waving. <laughs> thank you, Sumer Avi, for everything, always. <laughs> and Mickey Abla. <laughs> mm -hmm.
So are you planning to go back to Turkey soon or any future plans? Um, soon, uh, soon in my new well, Because world, of COVID issue probably. I'm, I'm thinking six months. So my, my goal is to stay in place in Atlanta for another six months or so and get back to, uh, to Istanbul and Hasan Cave in March of next year. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, hopefully COVID situation gets better and we, can, we travel more freely. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, um, I guess if there's no more questions, um, uh, I thank you again uh, for you and for the participants who listened to uh, this uh, live webinar and hope to meet in other in another events and yes uh, best wishes for you in atlanta thank you. <laughs> maybe you can visit michigan sometime before going so. back to turkey so. <laughs> zoom meetings are good but face to face is good as well yeah well thank you everyone uh, Ardam, if you have anything to add uh, no, I don't have anything to add. Uh, I would like to thank John first uh, for this nice presentation and everyone for joining us uh, and listening to this informative talk. Bye. Thank you so much. Yes. yes.